Hey guys, welcome back to 247 DIY. If you're interested in how to do an at-home hydro dip, go ahead and stick around because we're going to be using this kit from hydrodip.com to do a custom AR-15. Okay, so first I have to say this is an extremely well put together kit. Uh, right on top you have your instructions, you've got primer, you have your base coat, uh, activator, clear coat, they even include a mask, gloves, and dupe color prep wipes as well as a red scotch bright. Uh, now for this project um, I have a feeling these aren't going to be enough but I do love dupe colors um, prep products. Uh, I use their prep spray for all my painting projects and that's what we're primarily going to be using um, and I'm not sure that this is going to be quite enough with our red scotch bright but I have more of these on hand just from other projects. So what we're going to be dipping today um, is this AR-15 uh, that I have been slowly piecing together and building. Um, it's an AR pistol setup um, simply because of the length of the barrel. But more specifically, uh, what it is, um, this is a 45 ACP uh, direct blowback build. Um, and it also, instead of your traditional charging handle, um, it's a side charging setup. So, as I said before, uh, Duple Color Prep Spray is my preferred cleaner uh, when doing any type of painting project. Uh, gives you a very, very clean finish, a uh, very clean surface to bond your primer to. And before we can go ahead and start scuffing our surfaces up, the first thing you want to do is give everything a good wipe down with this prep spray. Uh, unfortunately, what can happen is if you don't do this ahead of time, you can work any grease or oil or contaminants into the surface, uh, which will contaminate your paint later on. So clean it prior to scuffing. Once your surfaces are nice and clean, then you can go ahead and take your Scotch-Brite pad and you can go ahead and start to rough up all of your surfaces. Now is when I'll go ahead and put some gloves on. Uh, we're going to be giving these another real good clean to get all of the dust from the scotch Bright pad and any more significant contaminants off the surfaces, but you want to make sure that while you're gripping these products you're not adding more oils from your hands onto the surface. Now one of the uh, bigger mistakes that I made the last time, um, I hydro dip one of my guns and I'm going to go ahead and show a close up on that in a little bit uh, just to show the mistakes I made last time um, compared to what I'm going to do this time to make sure I don't make those mistakes. Uh, but what I didn't do was make any type of jig for holding the part as it goes down into the dip. Um, I felt as though I could just kind of stick my fingers in and it seems like a good idea at the time uh, but it's actually very difficult to do. Um, to one, just to hold on to the part, but two, you start to get kind of shaky and the finish doesn't come out. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, jig these up real quick. So one way that works really well for jigging these up um, is to make a little setup like this. All this is is some scrap pipe I had slit and laying around. Um, I believe this is actually just scrap curtain rod from when we were remodeling some of the house. Um, and under here is simply some foam uh, pipe wrap 
um, that you would find around heating pipes uh, in your house. You can pick that up at the hardware store and it's wrapped in um, painter's tape. And if you look close you can see that it doesn't go all the way around and that's so that you can kind of get a custom size uh, to what you're trying to jig up. Now this particular part here doesn't really need any masking other than on the inside which will be done with the jig and you can just slide that right inside your handguard and then it gives you a nice pressure fit it's not going anywhere and you'll be able to handle that nicely when it comes time to go ahead and dip this alright so I went ahead and spared you guys the very tedious and boring process of getting the receiver uh, masked off so we don't get paint where we don't want paint to hold the receiver together because I do want to do this in one piece um, I just had some screws laying around I wrapped them in a little bit of masking tape to get the right size and they are shoved in there uh, holding the two pieces together and once again we've given it a handle uh, I didn't go ahead and use the foam because the interior of this is a bit uh, narrower than the handguard I just wrapped this pipe um, in masking tape till it got to be about the right size and slid that in and that's got a nice pressure fit to it so that we can dip that and finally nice and easy we made a jig here for the pistol brace and finally all we're going to do is um, take some wire this is just old coat hanger uh, that I cut up and you're going to tape that to the ends of the pipe uh, so that we can hang these from the jig itself so we can paint all right, so there's all three pieces that we're going to be dipping. Um, they've all been jigged up. They all have hangers on them now. Um, and tomorrow, we're going to be going ahead and starting painting. Um, the reason I say tomorrow is when I go ahead and I do these hydro dipping projects, I generally turn them into a three-day project. Uh, this is day one, um, scuffing, jigging, masking, prepping, all of that. And I usually find that at least mentally I'm kind of wore out uh, at this point. Um, so it's good to take a break. Um, also, I don't keep the heat on down here in this particular workshop. Um, so I'm going to bring these parts as well as the paint upstairs tonight. They can all reach um, a nice warm temperature so that everything will be good to go for painting tomorrow. Alright guys, here we are. Uh, day two. I've actually moved everything out into the garage. Um, I don't have good ventilation in the workshop I have down in the basement, so we've got the garage all warmed up, uh, good temperature for painting, and we're going to go ahead and keep moving on here. Uh, but the first thing I didn't do yesterday um, was to check and see if our plastic uh, pistol brace here was going to need to be flame treated or not. Um, it's a pretty simple process to determine it. You just find an inconspicuous area on the part, take a razor blade, and just cut off just a small sliver of the uh, plastic. Put it in a glass of water, swirl it around, and, and kind of dunk it underneath. If the piece of, if the little sliver of plastic floats, you need to flame treat your part. If it sinks or stays near the bottom, you're good to move ahead. Uh, the flame treating process isn't very hard. You can just take any source of flame. I'm going to be using this torch here, and all you have to do is just touch the plastic for about a second. So just you're not trying to melt the part. You're not trying to uh, do anything crazy here. Just pass the flame over the part. Um, so that that plastic can be ch touched for about a second um, in all of the areas. And so before we go ahead and paint guys, uh, we're just going to do one more uh, clean of these parts just to make sure everything's nice and clean before we go laying the paint on. And I am going to use these prep wipes that were included in the kit. They're going to be a lot more lint free uh, than using a rag with the prep spray. All right guys, so I've got the parts strung up here on a temporary cable I just stretched across the garage. Uh, we're in the back area of the garage here, so I don't have to worry too much about overspray. Um, and we're just gonna start off by uh, applying our primer.
Alright guys, so we've gone ahead and allowed the primer to dry up and we're going to go ahead and spray on the base coat now. All right guys, so with that, we have our four coats laid down. Uh, I'm gonna let them hang out here in the barn for a bit, uh, just for the paint to set up a bit uh, before I move them inside so that they can be in the warmth overnight. And we'll be back in the morning so we can actually go ahead and dip these. All right guys, so here we are, uh, last day of this project. We're gonna go ahead and finally get these parts dipped. Um, I've done a little bit of work off camera. You can see I've already started to mask this. Um, and what I'm going to do this time uh, that's different than the other uh, gun I've done in the past um, is we're going to go ahead and do a double dip on these. And actually before we get too far here, let me go ahead and show you uh, the Remington 870 I did previously. Um, I'll show you what didn't go quite so well with doing a, a roll method um, and that's why I'm going with a two-sided method this time. So this is that Remington 870 pump that I did. Um, I set this up just in camo as a turkey gun, uh, but let's look at some of the mistakes that I made when I did this one. So what happened in quite a few spots, um, and the most obvious is right through here, um, you can see this kind of this streaking. Um, and this was because of two things. It's because I did the roll method versus the two-sided method, um, as well as not using jigs. Um, but basically what this is is when your hand is not steady enough and you're trying to roll it and you're kind of dipping in and out of the water That's when you get these uh, Streaks across because you're kind of laying more ink over top of ink that's already there So I've got this in a few spots again. It's not the end of the world. This is a camo pattern um, So that's not a huge deal one other thing I had happen uh, quite a few times um, you can see here um, this kind of weird blemish and what this was was the dip would look perfect um, after it was dipped and then I would come up to rinse and the rinse would actually start rinsing the ink and some of the base coat right off of the part after doing some research it looks like there could be a couple of reasons for this um, one maybe I didn't lay the base coat on thick enough so when you actually go ahead and dip the part um, the activator can actually kind of start to 
uh, cause the base coat to come off a little bit. So it's possible that going a little heavier with the base coat may have fixed this, but one thing that I did learn um, that I figured out that resolved this was instead of immediately going to the rinse, letting these parts hang for two to five minutes, um, and then going to the rinse, um, I didn't notice it happen nearly as much. And again, just another example of what goes wrong when you're not using um, jigs so you can have a steady hand. You can see I've got a nice thumbprint right here because um, as I was going down in with this uh, barrel guard here, um, it started to slip and so I kind of panic grabbed and, and my thumb stuck right there and, you know, no ink stuck there. And the only other thing I noticed which happened in a few spots, um, you can actually see some paint um, has chipped off here and that was a little bit because of the pressure when this um, weaver rail mount uh, gets bolted on, it squeezed here and it chipped this off. But really what that means is there wasn't a good adhesion to the primer to this receiver. Um, and if you've ever seen um, a stock 870 receiver, not the tactical version, but just a standard 870 receiver, um, it's a very smooth, shiny surface. And this was also a well-used, well-taken-care-of gun uh, beforehand. So I imagine there was quite a bit of gun oil on the surface of this receiver. In addition to that smooth, very hard surface, I don't think scuffing it with a Scotch-Brite was quite enough. Uh, so I didn't get um, very good adhesion with the primer. Um, a part like this that's a very hard, smooth metal that potentially could have a lot of contaminants in it will be a great candidate for sandblasting rather than trying to scuff with a Scotch-Brite. But all in all, I'm pretty happy with how this actually came out didn't come out too bad and like I said before for a camo pattern some imperfections it's really not the end of the world and it also provided me with a great learning opportunity um, for this go around uh, on this AR-15 we're, we're doing. Alright so back to what we've gone ahead and done um, I've masked off one side that we don't want the dip on and you can see along the top which is going to be the most visible part of, of this stock I've left the tape kind of laid up and what that's going to do is, when we go back and do the second dip, we'll do the same thing, and it's going to kind of fade both sides into each other, so you don't have a very sharp line down the center, um, and it kind of meshes both sides together nicely. Down on the bottom, I'm not too concerned about that, because it's not going to be seen very well, so I've gone with a sharp line, and we've gone all along the edges here. These are all going to be sharp cutoffs along the edges. So let's go ahead and talk about my setup and what I do. Um, this is just a very basic, um, once in a while, at home, hydro dipping setup. Um, this is a 105 gallon plastic tote. And unfortunately down here in the workshop I use in the basement, I don't have um, any taps, any access to water down here. Um, so what I do is I transfer using a five gallon pail and I use a just a household uh, meat thermometer and I monitor the temperature of the water coming out of the tap. We come down, we transfer to the tote until it's at a level that I like. So now let's go ahead and measure some film. So the first thing we need to do is get our first piece of film cut and measured. So first what I like to do um, is you're going to get this leading edge taped. Um, now if you have access to a professional a uh, hydro dipping tank that has movable adjustable dams. You don't need to tape and the argument is out there that without tape you will get a much better finished product. I'm just using this tote so I prefer to tape my edges um, that way once you spray your activator your film doesn't spread to the size of the tank. Um, it's worked perfectly fine the other times I've hydro dipped so first we're going to go ahead and get this leading edge taped up. And you can see how this wants to curl pretty aggressively. Um, certain types of film will do this. This one's going to do it because it's very heavily inked. There's lots of very heavy blacks and everything in this film. Uh, films like that are going to want to curl. And then me personally, I don't feel the need to have um, a full width of tape here. So I'm just going to take a razor blade and we're going to cut this down to about half size. So the next thing we need to do is lay our part out um, and figure out the size of film that we're going to want to do this dip. 
Um, you want kind of a happy balance between not wasting a ton of film, but having a good amount of overlap so that when you go down in the water, you're not fighting the edges, especially if you're using a tape barrier. So you can just kind of lay your part down. That should be more than enough. We'll do equal amounts of space on either side. Again, your edges are gonna wanna curl up. So like over here, I've just uh, used an object just to weight down that corner so it doesn't curl. Once again, we're gonna use our tape. We're gonna get this side edge tape down. Now I'm probably gonna just go all the way across this piece. But for now, I'm just gonna lay a piece of tape up to the point that we're gonna need for this part. And looking at it now, it looks like it's gonna make more sense just to kind of split this roll of film right down the middle. And just like the leading edge, we'll go ahead and cut a good amount, roughly half of this film off of the bench. And then what you want to do if you are using um, tape for your dams, you just want to take your corners. You're not going to cut all the way through, probably about three quarters of the way through to the edge, right about there. Every three, four inches, do the same thing. And you're going to do that all the way around. And there's that all set and ready to go. And then one thing you can do um, so that you know which side needs to go down into the water, simply take your thumb and index finger, lick them, and on the very corner of your film that's not going to be needed for dipping the part, pinch the film and you'll feel one side will stick and one side won't stick at all. So underneath here, this is my sticky side, that's the side that's going to go down in the water. So now let's go ahead and get our container filled with water. Um, again, all I do is go upstairs, I fill my five gallon bucket with water. This particular kit's calling for 92 to 96 degrees. I'm gonna aim for that 96 degree mark because inevitably it's probably gonna cool a little bit um, as I make trips up and down to get enough water. Let's go ahead and get that done. So now we need to lay the film down on the water. Now what you're going to want to do is you're going to grab it corner to corner so that it forms kind of a taco. And you're just going to slowly lay that down on the water so that it doesn't trap any air bubbles. And you're going to allow that to hydrate for 60 seconds to so start your timer and let it do its thing. Now if it shows up on camera, and I'm not sure it will, you can see there's some slight rippling um, in the film. That's why people recommend if you have the ability to not have to tape your borders, go ahead and do it. Um, again, I don't have dams that I'm able to use for this container, so taping the edges is just going to have to do. Now we're going to go ahead and spray our activator about 12 inches off the surface, and we're going to go at a relatively slow to medium pace. Now we're just going to go ahead and dip our part. We're going to come in at an angle, about 45 degrees or so, and a nice, slow, controlled movement down into the dip.
Now I'm gonna go ahead and hang this. Uh, it's one thing I kind of learned a little bit um, on the last one that I did. Let it hang for two to three minutes before we go to rinse. I'm not gonna film that part, mainly just because my kitchen's extremely dirty right now, but I'm just gonna bring it upstairs to the tap. You're gonna run it under lukewarm water until all of this slime disappears. And then you're gonna hang it up, let it dry. Once you're completely dry, you can do the other side, but we got our other parts to do yet. Alright guys, so here we are after the other sides have been dipped. Uh, we're just waiting for these to dry completely so we can add some clear coat. Uh, all in all, I'm extremely happy with how these came out. Um, some of these same mistakes uh, that I had last time, I didn't make this time. And I'll talk more on that uh, at the end of the video. And of course, I'm no professional when it comes to this, so there are some imperfections. And again, I'll... Uh, I'll touch on those at the end of the video when we've got these dried, uh, clear coated, and off their jigs here. Alright guys, so the last thing we're going to go ahead and do today is we're going to spray this uh, 2K matte clear coat and uh, that will finish up for today. Alright guys, so here it is, all unmasked and somewhat put back together. I got a little ahead of myself, I was a little excited, so I uh, got the lower all built out here uh, somewhat. Still waiting on the buffer system yet, but um, here it is. Uh, all in all, 
I think this came out much better than the other attempt that I did on that 870. Um, none of the pattern is stretched. There's none of those striations from those kind of hesitation or unsteady marks. And all in all, I'm very happy with it. I think it came out very good. I really, really like this pattern. Uh, the only other thing I did, uh, the lighting down here I think is showing a little more glossy than it ended up being, but as I said earlier, um, when we were spraying that clear coat you saw in the video, I wasn't happy with how shiny it was. So I actually took a red scotch bright and very lightly just came through and I scuffed this clear coat up just to take a lot of the sheen off of it. It's still a little shinier. I wish it was a bit flatter than this. Um, but like I said, I think if I had done four or five just light mist coats to build up a protective coating but not allow the clear to actually gloss up, I think that would have been better. So I'm going to actually try that again um, on my AR-10 um, this summer. I believe I have plenty of film left. I'm going to try a different base coat. I think I'm going to go with a bluish gray um, with this print laid on top of that. So if you want to see that, be sure to subscribe to my channel. That way you don't miss that. But hopefully that will be coming out this summer. But let's go ahead and take a little bit of a closer look at this. And I'll show you some of the imperfections that we did get. So if I kind of hold it at an angle here. Um, and I get my lighting to kind of create some reflection. You can kind of see these, these little bumps all over the surface. And what this was, what I noticed... Um, is it's actually like these little bumps where the ink didn't lay down and touch the base coat all the way. Right now they're just bumps that are going to stay there because the clear coat has covered this and kind of encased those in place. Um, but what happened was any side that I went to do again where I had masking tape, and you might be able to see it a little bit here, like there's a couple there um, right at the tip of my finger where the masking tape would actually pull that ink off and expose the base coat underneath. Now, from what I've looked at, the research I've done, I believe that that could be one of two things, if not both. Uh, one would be that I slightly underactivated. Using more activator um, may have eliminated this, this problem. Um, the other thing it may have been was, and it, again, it comes down to not having a professional dip tank. Uh, when you use that tape method, um, the the film can't kind of pull in and wrap around the part because it's being kind of held in place by that tape barrier. So you find yourself kind of chasing the ink across the water with the part. And so toward the end of the dip, the part lays a little bit flatter. Um, so it may be um, just some little air bubbles that would have normally ran off the surface, but because I started coming down in a real shallow angle, those bubbles may have stayed on the surface. Because um, if you up here where I started in with the dip there really isn't any and it's this, the same goes for for the other parts um, there I didn't see much of this right where the part actually enters the dip and then as we get back toward uh, where the last bit went in where it started to get to its flattest because I was chasing that ink across the surface that's where you start to see more of this blemishing so it's one of two things it's either underactivated or um, I just need to get a slightly better technique and make sure I'm maintaining that like 45 degree angle all the way into the water. Alright guys, so that's going to do it for this episode. Feel free to leave a comment below. Let me know what you think. Um, as always, make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit that like button, and thank you for watching.